Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Permafix Fiscal 2022 Year-End Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants have been placed on a listen-only mode, and we will open the floor for your questions and comments after the presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, David Waltman. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Permafix Environmental Services' fourth quarter year-end 2022 conference call. On the call with us this morning are Mark Duff, President and CEO, Dr. Lou Senefani, Executive Vice President of Strategic Initiatives, and Ben Nacarato, Chief Financial Officer. The company issued a press release this morning containing fourth quarter 2022 financial results, which is also posted on the company's website. If you have any questions after the call or would like any additional information about the company, please contact Crescendo Communications at 212-671-1020. I'd also like to remind everyone that certain statements contained within this conference call may be deemed forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995 and include certain non-GAAP financial measures. All statements on this conference call, other than a statement of historical fact or forward-looking statements that are subject to known and unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors which could cause actual results and performance of the company to differ materially from such statements. These risks and uncertainties are detailed in the company's filings with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, as well as this morning's press release. The company makes no commitment to disclose any revisions to forward-looking statements or any facts, events, or circumstances after the date hereof that bear upon forward-looking statements. In addition, today's call will include references to non-GAAP measures. Permafix believes that such information provides an additional measurement and consistent historical comparison of its performance. A reconciliation of the non-GAAP measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures is available in today's news release on our website. I'd now like to turn the call over to Mark Duff. Please go ahead, Mark. All right. Thanks, David, and good morning, everyone. 2022 was a transformative year as we built a solid foundation for growth in the upcoming year. We're finally seeing a return to normalization and the momentum we had prior to the pandemic. The weakness in revenue we experienced in 2022 was due to the lingering effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on delaying some of the projects in the services and the treatment segments. Nevertheless, we achieved a 58% increase in gross profit in the fourth quarter, which was due to improved profitability in the services projects compared to last year. In addition, uh, total gross profit margins increased from roughly 7 to 12%. While 2022 was a challenging year, we believe we're back on the growth trajectory primarily due to the recent improvement we've seen in our treatment segment. Within our treatment segment, we've experienced a steady improvement in waste receipts. Specifically, our average receipts per quarter have steadily returned to pre-pandemic levels uh, over the last nine months uh, of the year. This is best reflected in our backlog, which was 9.2 million at year end, significantly higher than prior quarters. This was a result of increased waste shipments from DOE as well as our efforts to broaden our client base uh, into the commercial uh, utility sector as well as oil and gas uh, and other industrial markets. It's important to note that the fourth quarter of 2022 was negatively impacted by challenges associated with labor issues uh, and high attrition rates due to the Department of Energy hiring campaigns at several other sites which are near our facilities, uh, as well as supply chain impacts uh, from availability of waste processing materials uh, such as grout mix, we also experienced severe weather impacts due to record low temperatures uh, in the Tri-Cities area of Washington. However, these issues have begun to subside in the, in the first quarter of 2022, excuse me, first quarter of 2023, uh, with uh, hiring uh, at each location realizing stability uh, compared uh, to the last two quarters. In addition uh, to the growth of our base business, we're, we're rapidly advancing several initiatives that we believe have the potential to significantly enhance our revenues and our long-term backlog. For instance, we've realized two important steps forward with the Department of Energy in pursuit of our Hanford initiatives uh, that hold significant potential growth for many years. These initiatives include uh, the January 31st amendment uh, of the Record of Decision, or ROD, for the final tank closure and waste management EIS uh, that was originally uh, developed in 2013 as well as an announcement uh, this past Friday for the notice of availability for the waste incidental to reprocessing, what we call the WEIR uh, report, uh, which is in support of the test bed initiative uh, demonstration, what we call TBI. First, I'll touch base on the First Amendment. The amendment of, to the ROD 
uh, for the direct feed low activity, uh, which we'll call, refer to as the DF law facility, uh, was, supports the secondary waste program also in, uh, at the Hanford site uh, in Washington, represents a sizable opportunity over the next decade. And while we can't provide too many specifics at this time, suffice to say that Permafix will provide the recommended treatment solutions for radioactive waste streams uh, produced by the DF law program once it gets operational. This waste is estimated by DOE to be over 8,000 cubic meters annually. Will be begin to be received at Permafix facilities upon a hot startup of the plant, currently projected to begin uh, in the late 2024 timeframe. To put this in perspective, this volume of waste would more than double the production of all of our plants combined on an annual basis. Uh, and, and given the fixed cost nature of our business, this could result in very significant cash flows uh, over the next 10 year period. The second step forward, as I mentioned, is the final uh, waste incidental to reprocessing or weir document uh, published this week by DOE, which states that the program, or the proposed the TBI program, would demonstrate a supplemental uh, law treatment approach. Uh, the weir went on to state that based on the final evaluation, DOE determined that the pre treated and solidified waste from the tanks is incidental to reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel, is not high-level waste, and is to be managed as low-level waste. This progress opens the door for DOE to work with the Washington State Department of Ecology, which is a regulator, to develop and approve the regulatory documents for shipment of the Phase II program. Uh, the Phase II includes uh, grouting disposal of 2,000 gallons of tank waste currently anticipated to be shipped before the end of the year. These developments underscore the important role that Permafix will be playing in the long-term mission for hand for closure in support of both the DF law vitrification program as well as the supplemental tank waste treatment program that will likely include commercial grouting. As discussed last quarter, the TBI initiative holds the potential to save tens of billions of dollars, of taxpayer dollars, as well as eliminate significant carbon emissions uh, and reduce schedules for Hanford cleanup. Permafix maintains these capabilities today at our Permafix Northwest facility, which is permitted and outfitted to safely and compliantly grout up to 30,000 gallons a month, with the ability to expand well over a million gallons annually, while dramatically reducing cost uh, compared to vitrification. Within the services segments, we've reached full operational status on several projects that have been delayed due to the impact uh, of the pandemic. In addition, we've secured important new projects that we expect will begin in the second quarter of 2023. As the impacts from the pandemic continue to fade, the federal government has begun to announce new projects that have been on hold. These procurement cycles are moving forward to support the increased funding levels, which we anticipate will result in a number of additional opportunities to be awarded in the coming quarters. As a result, we have now over $200 million in defined procurement opportunities targeted to be released uh, in the next few quarters. In addition, we continue to await some very large potential strategic awards by the DOE. Some of these projects are quite considerable in size, uh, and if selected by DOE, would represent substantial increases in sustainable revenue to align with our core competencies. Some of these upcoming DOE project announcements include the $45 billion Hanford integrated tank disposition contract, and the $3 billion operations and site mission support project, which are both likely to be awarded uh, in the second quarter. If we are successful, we would participate as a team member on these large DOE procurements, both of which completely align with our strengths and innovations in radiological protection and waste management. Uh, we're also close to announcement uh, of another project uh, that we've referred to in past calls uh, through the Joint Research Council uh, in Italy, which uh, this project would support our expansion program in, in Europe and open the door for deployment of our treatment technologies uh, in these uh, rapidly growing markets uh, in Europe. We've also received several, <clears throat> excuse me, strategic awards. <clears throat> over the past few months, specifically associated with our soil sorter technology, including announcement last week that our team was awarded the first abandoned uranium mine closure task order in support of the new EPA abandoned mine program. 
while this initial task order uh, represents only about a million dollars in revenue for 2023, we're anticipating rapid expansion of the program following deployment of our technology uh, into the first site, uh, which is located in the Northeast Arizona region. Awards have also been realized at several DOE locations that will support backlog generation in 2023. In addition, uh, we're well positioned for several upcoming procurement initiatives for the U.S. Department of Engineer, uh, Corps of Engineers, uh, the U.S. Navy, uh, and several other DOE site projects uh, that are supposed to be secured uh, in the next few quarters. As a result of these factors, it's clear to us that there is significant pent-up demand and that we expect to benefit from improved budgets and carryover spending from last year. As a result, we maintain uh, an optimistic view that 2023 will see a significant improvement over 2022. As I mentioned earlier, we're already seeing signs of that improvement. Turning back to our financials for a moment, adjusted EBITDA, for Q4 2022 improved to a loss of uh, $1 million uh, compared to a loss of $1.7 in the prior uh, year, uh, Q4 2021. Aside from our expectations of solid revenue growth having a positive impact on our EBITDA going forward, we continue to focus on a reduction of non-billable uh, indirect operating costs uh, as well as sg ex- expenses. As a result, we anticipate a meaningful improvement in profitability and cash flow going forward. At the same time, we continue to invest our, in our capabilities and our facilities. We've built a solid foundation for growth and a highly scalable infrastructure. As a result, we believe we're in a great position to take advantage of the pent-up demand that we've mentioned. As we continue to increase revenues, we expect to benefit from the predictable cash flows within our serv- services segment and high incremental margins uh, from our treatment segment. Overall, we remain confident in our ability to achieve the growth and stability we experienced prior to the pandemic. Given our increasing backlog, our solid pipeline of nuclear services projects and several potentially transformative events we've mentioned uh, that could materialize over the next coming months and years. On that note, I'll now turn it over to Ben who will discuss our financial results in a little more detail. Ben? Thank you, Mark. Um, Let's start with revenue. Our total revenue for the from continuing operations for the quarter was $16.8 million, compared to last year's fourth quarter of $17.1, a decrease of $359,000 or 2.1%. The decrease was primarily due to a drop in our treatment segment revenue of about $290. Um, despite a good quarter on the waste receipt side, processing, as you mentioned, was impacted by supply chain, labor, and inclement weather. Despite these delays, volume did um, have a positive impact on revenue, uh, but there was a offset from uh, lower average pricing, and that's uh, not uncommon. It's just related to waste mix. Um, in the service segment, revenue was down slightly by 69000 and that's really just timing of on-site projects. Uh, for, 2020, for the year ended 2022, our revenue was $70.6 million compared to $72.2 million. Uh, last year. In the treatment segment, revenue increased slightly by 366000 due to the higher waste volume uh, and then offset by average lower average pricing as with the quarter. On the service segment revenue, it was down by $2 million, primarily from the slow start of the first quarter um, up at two of our larger projects, but uh, the productivity ramped up production in Q2 through 4. On the gross profit side, um, gross profit for the quarter was $2 million compared to $1.3 million in 2021. Uh, the increase in gross profit of approximately $741,000 was from the services segment, which um, was the result of improved profitability of our current projects uh, worked on, which uh, included it a 19.8 reduction in project-related variable costs. This improvement was offset by a reduction in gross profit from the treatment segment due to the processing delays we discussed previously, as well as an increase in fixed expenses at the plants related to labor and utilities. For the year ended 2022, the gross profit was 9.6 million compared to 6.8 million in 21. This improvement in gross profit came from the services segment, where 
Again, the improved project profitability contributed $4.7 million in improved gross profit, and that was offset uh, by a small decrease in the gross profit um, from lower revenue. This increase in gross profit in the service segment was offset by the decrease in treatment segment, again, from lower revenue waste mix or lower margin mix of waste and the increased facility costs. Our total G&A for the quarter was $3.6 million compared to $3.3 million in the fourth quarter last year. And while SG&A for the full year was $14.7 million compared to $12.8 million in 2021. SG&A expenses for the quarter were higher as marketing expenses were up from increased payroll, trade show expenses, and commissions earned. Admin expenses for the quarter were higher from higher payroll benefits, audit fees, uh, write-off of patents, and stock option compensation, as well as permafix medical costs, which are no longer absorbed by our previous medical segment. Similar to the quarter, our G&A costs were up for the year in marketing from payroll and trade show and travel. Admin expenses were higher due to audit, outside services, and increased payroll costs no longer absorbed by the, the medical segment. Our net loss attributable to common shareholders for the quarter was $1.7 million compared to last year's net loss of $2.5 million. For the year ended 12-31, 2022, our net loss attributable to common shareholders was $3.8 million compared to net income of $835,000 in prior year. Our basic and diluted net loss per share for the quarter was $0.13 cents compared to loss of $0.19 cents in the prior year. Loss per share for the year ended December 31 was $0.29 cents per share compared to income of 7 in the prior year. Adjusted EBITDA from continuing operations, as we defined in this morning's press release, was a loss of $1 million compared to a loss of $1.7 million last year. For the year ended 2022, adjusted EBITDA was a loss of $3.3 million compared to a loss of $4.4 million in 2021. Turning to the balance sheet, our cash on the balance sheet was $1.9 million compared to $4.4 million at year end reflecting the losses for the year. Our accounts receivable were down $2 million, reflecting improved collections, primarily in the service segment. Our unbilled receivables were down $2.9 million, reflecting increased billing in a large project that was nearing completion. Other assets were up $1.1 million, uh, partially due to the employment retention credit of $2 million, uh, which is still outstanding. Our current liabilities were down $3.2 million from payment of outstanding payables and the reduction in unearned revenue of approximately $767,000. As of December 30, as of December 2022, our treatment backlog sits at $9.2 million, up from $7.1 million, both at year-end 2021 and September of 2022. Our total debt for the at quarter end was $1 million, excluding debt issuance costs, which is mostly owed to PNC Bank. Finally, on the cash flow side, uh, for 2022, our cash provided by continuing operations came in at 164000 Cash used by discontinued operations was 717000 Cash used for investing of continuing operations was 997 thousand primarily capital related and cash used for financing was nine hundred and twenty one thousand representing payments <coughs> to loan and capital line of five hundred and two thousand and payments related to finance lease liabilities and other debt uh, of approximately four hundred and nineteen thousand. With that operator I'll now turn the call over to questions. Certainly. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you have any questions or comments, please press star 1 on your phone at this time. 
We do ask that while posing your question, please pick up your handset if you're listening on speakerphone to provide optimum sound quality. Once again, if you have any questions or comments, please press star 1 on your phone. Your first question is coming from Howard Browse from Wellington Shields. Your line is live. Thank you. Uh, Mark, Ben, Lou, I uh, hope you and your, your families are doing well. Thank you. Morning, Howard. Good morning. So, uh, first things first, for full disclosure, I need to say that I was the investment banker for your equity raise of $6.2 million September of 2021. And in addition, members of my immediate family own shares in Permafix. So let me get to a couple of important questions. Uh, the Department of Energy just published various comments relating to DF law. The executive decision specifically mentions and only mentions Permafix Northwest as a facility to treat which seems to be enormous quantities of secondary waste. They talk about 8,300 cubic meters of solid and liquid waste annually, which if I converted that to liquid, which I, I have questions about, it's about 2.2 2 million gallons of if it's liquid waste, 18 cubic meters of uh, mid-level waste and 332 cubic meters of mid-level waste. Because it's a combination of liquids and solids, can you give me a sense of what the annual revenues the Permafix could be starting if you're operational in 2025, as an example. Sure, Howard. Yeah, you really can't do a uh, a real conversion of those quantities because the a lot of that 8,300 uh, cubic meters is debris or other solid waste like PPE or per personal protective equipment, uh, right. other things that get contaminated, those kinds of things. So it's difficult to do that. Uh, we looked at the uh, various types of waste to be generated compared to what we do now. And as I mentioned uh, before in, in the script, it's about double our total input now for waste, all of our plants combined. Uh, and um, But we do have, I, I do want to mention, we do have a contract with the tank contractor that will likely be novated. Uh, and that, it's like it's an MSA, a Master Services Agreement type of contract. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's got rates, and we've talked to them about rates. So, uh, applying our rates to the volumes of each individual waste stream uh, are, looks to be about an annual revenue of between 65 and 75 million a year. Uh, so it is a significant increase in revenue uh, for that plant and, and the company overall. Uh, that 65 to 75 million could vary, uh, you know, depending on how much of which waste stream changes along the way, uh, and it could also very dependent on uh, the radionuclide content uh, that was received. Uh, you know, there's different charges for different types of levels of radioactivity uh, and those types of things. But generally, uh, when that that plant is running, uh, the DFL plant is running at full capacity, uh, which is right now, understand, the uh, design capacity for the plant is to treat a million gallons a year. When it gets to that level, then... Um, I think we'll be able to expect, uh, you know, over 8,000 cubic meters a year. And basically, this will be at your normalized treatment margin. Is that a correct statement? Most generally, yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's some inflation. Obviously, it's going to have to occur along the way. Uh, the the uh, natural gas prices uh, in the tri the uh, Tri Cities area have gone up dramatically compared to the rest of the country, uh, and things like that, and labor issues, but. But yeah, generally the um, the margins will be what we make now on waste treatment uh, as a whole. Will you need to hire any additional personnel for this specific award? Yeah, there will be. Uh, you know, this will ex be expected, as I mentioned uh, in the script. Uh, right now, DOE is very uh, casual, or I should say, informal about when the startup of the plant will occur. Uh, the predicting at this point in time that it'll be late 2024. Uh, and then it'll get rolling uh, through 25. I would expect them to take a year, year and a half, to get the full capacity if everything went well. Uh, and um, uh, I'm sorry, what's your question, Howard? I'm already... No, additional personnel. Oh, additional personnel, yeah. So at full capacity, uh, I would anticipate uh, between 70 to 75, maybe and 100 people. Additional. 
Yeah, and ad additional to current staff, correct. What you're basically talking about, if I do some numbers, you're talking about earnings just in this contract fully deployed in, say, 2025, almost uh, $3 in earnings. Does that sound about right? I, I, I'm not qualified at this point to do a uh, to do that math, I should say qualified. <laughs> I haven't done that math, uh, but uh, it sounds about like it might be about the right number uh, generally. Okay, let me continue because the DOE has published probably 1,500 different pages of items. Let's talk about the the TBI. What's interesting about the uh, the TBI comments: 2,000 gallons, assuming that's done by the end of the year. They also mention that they have no desire, and this is in uh, the document, Final Waste Incidental to Reprocessing Evaluation for the Test Bed Initiative Demonstration. Um, and this came out um, March 16th. And on pages 4 20, 21, and 22, effectively they have said that they have no desire to do what you and I would look at as the third phase of 300,000 gallons. And this does imply that they're looking to go from the 2,000 gallons, assuming it's successful, right to full capacity. I'd like your comment about that. Yeah, we, we've had a number of meetings with DOE in the last few weeks uh, about uh, – the overall TBI program, and have asked before about that. And, and DOE's response has generally been the same as it's been, and I've, as I've described on prior phone calls, and that is that they have a, a roadmap uh, that uh, they refer to, which integrates uh, their strategy for tank cleanup. And it includes, you know, it's largely based on the DF law facility, you know, which DOE has $14 billion invested in. Uh, and obviously decades of construction, getting that plant up and running, and that's kind of the centerpiece of it. Uh, TBI uh, and grouting uh, certainly fits into that roadmap, as they refer to it. Uh, when it occurs uh, is uh, going to be dependent on uh, when DFLAW gets rolling, uh, funding, uh, how the DFLAW facility works, uh, other types of, of regulatory considerations, uh, and those types of things. Uh, and in, in, in their response to whether they're going to go to 300,000 gallon versus right into a production level, uh, I don't think DOE's made that decision yet, period. Uh, whether they call it a TBI uh, or low-level waste offsite disposition, is, which is what they refer to congressionally, uh, that, that remains to be seen. But the supplemental program for grouting uh, is certainly seems to be, a, uh, and has been, I've been told, is a part of that the overall roadmap. Uh, so to answer your question, Howard, uh, whether it's 300,000 gallons as phase three of TBI or whether it's moving right into an operational phase, DOE has laid the groundwork so far uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, from through the weir that you mentioned and it also through the environmental assessment uh, to support their NEPA requirements. Those have all been done. Uh, they have a, another hurdle to address uh, which is a smaller hurdle uh, with the state of, of uh, Washington for the R D D permit, which is required to pump the waste out of the tank to ship to us. Once that's done, they can start going. Uh, and as you know, there's another a method of that they're pumping out now through what they call the Tisker. The Tisker is pumping right. waste. The UE is, has planned on on pumping 800,000 gallons this calendar year with that uh, and putting it in storage for DF law. Uh, and uh, once that gets full, uh, I think there's a you know an opportunity to to uh, also grout some of that. So DOE has not agreed to that yet, uh, but uh, you know depends on when DF law gets up and running. You know if it's just around the corner or if it's a good ways off. I'm sure there'll be opportunities uh, to talk to DOE about that potential as well. So uh, to answer your question specifically, I don't think DOE uh, has given a lot of consideration to whether it's phase three of TBI or whether it's right in an operational phase. On an operational phase, what kind of capacity could you use in, or excuse me, um, work on in terms of, say, 2025? 
you know, we can do 30,000 gallons a month as uh, to, tomorrow. Uh, our permits and our facilities support that throughput, uh, and um, we can expand that through a minor permit mod uh, and some uh, minor capital improvements up to a million. Uh, and with some additional mods, uh, you can get that up to several million. Uh, but uh, right now, about 300,000 gallons a year is what our current capacity is, uh, whatever DU is ready to go. And uh, this is standard treatment margins again? Yeah, that's correct. And would you need additional uh, people to process this? Uh, up to, to, uh, to 300,000 300, gallons would be about 25 people total uh, to run that operation. Uh, and um, it, it, uh, a lot of that depends on how fast we're receiving the waste, whether we go to a second shift or a third shift, uh, or whether it's uh, over a longer period of time, which we can do in the one shift. So that will vary, but 15 to 25 people is probably a good estimate to, if we were running at full 30,000 gallons a month. 30,000 gallons a month, if you just did that, you're talking about uh, 75 cents a share, give or take. And of course, Again, capacity, I, you can be talking about. I, could, I can't, certainly couldn't dollars. verify those numbers hour, but that, that, that sounds like potentially about right. All right. Everybody's going to be wanting to talk to you, uh, lastly, about ITDC. Um, we're expecting a decision momentarily. Is that a correct statement? You know, DOE uh, has been uh, very uh, difficult to pin down in regards to their schedule and the procurement. Uh, right now, DOE has been uh, consistently saying, that I've been hearing, that uh, it'll be sometime uh, in Q, by the end of Q1, which obviously is only a week away. So I have to believe it's sometime in Q2 for both ITDC and the OSMS. OSMS, they have been more vocal about an award uh, in the May time frame. Uh, but the ITDC, I, I'm going to assume Howard is any day, uh, and uh, but likely in uh, Q2 before, at least in April time frame. The OSMS is Paducah Portsmouth. Is that the one? That's yes. Yeah, that's the uh, Duff Six uh, right. uh, management contract, and as well as Portsmouth Paducah infrastructure contract together. Assume for the moment that your group wins the ITDC contract which we all hope to do, what does that mean to you other than 15 years and it's $45 billion? You're not doing $45 billion, but what could you be doing as a part of it? And the That's second really question to that is, if you lose because you're a small business, will you still participate? Yeah, it, it's very difficult to answer the question, the first question, Howard. This, okay. As I've told many investors, this, this procurement is quite unusual uh, and it's so large and so complex, D, we did not require uh, a baseline schedule uh, or a baseline cost estimate, uh, which means that uh, there's very little costing provided uh, in very uh, less detail uh, on what what each firm, uh, each team member is doing specifically. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's like a closure contract in that you uh, will negotiate, the winner will negotiate task orders for all the components of scope uh, during the transition period, uh, at that time you'll understand you know, which pieces of scope specifically you're going to be contractually required to do, uh, how many people are going to come with it, uh, and that type of thing. So none of that will be defined by any of the winners uh, until after transition is off and running. So that, I really can't answer what the overall financial impact is. Uh, as a small business, uh, as I mentioned uh, as well in the past, uh, there is a very significant a small business set aside requirement for the winner. Uh, it's a formula of overall revenue, but generally, the uh, uh, small business set aside goals average uh, about two hundred million dollars a year. A year, two hundred million dollars annually uh, for small business uh, goals. Uh, that's a pretty significant amount, uh, and um, you know, we still remain a small business uh, qualified to do that. Uh, so the second part of your question, uh, if we were not selected, we would certainly be uh, a very viable uh, way for the winning team to meet their small business goals, uh, as well as provide uh, you know, the value proposition uh, we provided to our team. Uh, and uh, we're 
highly optimistic that if we don't win, we'll be able to attain a good portion of that uh, that work uh, if it's not already uh, accounted for by another another team member. And I'll get back into queue. Mark, uh, best of luck. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Howard. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Aaron Warwick from Breakout Investors. Your line is live. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the call. I appreciate all of Howard's questions and, and your answers to those to give us more clarity. I wanted to talk about Hanford a little bit as well, but also wanted to look more near term and get some clarity. It sounds like the business has really uh, turned a corner here after the pandemic. And just trying to get a sense of, do you expect to be profitable in uh, this fiscal year? Yeah, Q1 looks a lot better uh, than Q4 did, uh, Aaron. I appreciate your question. Uh, and um, Q2 uh, has a lot of things uh, happening that are very exciting that uh, are projected uh, to be much better than Q1. Uh, and um, so we certainly expect to be profitable uh, in Q2. Uh, and Q1 is still still a couple of things we're waiting to see come in. Uh, but Q2 is very exciting. We have the Ewok uh, facility here in Oak Ridge that we've been carrying for uh, at least for about three years now. Uh, it's finally starting to uh, generate real revenue. Uh, we've got a big project we're doing there uh, and several others pending. Uh, that gets rolling has gotten rolling here in the last uh, 10 days uh, and will run uh, at full capacity just about uh, through Q2. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, as I mentioned in the notes, we've won a number of projects that are all getting rolling uh, in Q2 as well. Uh, and uh, that includes the abandoned uranium mines uh, as well as uh, some commercial contracts, uh, a project at, in, uh, in San Diego with the Navy, uh, and um, uh, two or three uh, new projects with DOE at different sites, uh, Los Alamos and Livermore, uh, all of, all of getting rolling uh, in April. So uh, Q2 looks really good, uh, and uh, uh, our backlog will be increasing, uh, and um, some of the headwinds I described before, which includes labor and, and um, supply chain issues, uh, are all are really behind us. Uh, we've uh, replaced a lot of people. Uh, that have been on board now for three or four months of so their train, they're rolling, uh, and um, we're pretty confident that Q2 will be uh, well into uh, profitable range uh, moving forward. Oh, fantastic. Sounds, that sounds good. So you mentioned the EPA, and I've noticed that they've been moving forward with a lot of different projects that have kind of been delayed because of COVID and other reasons. Um, and uh, the, the, the project that you mentioned, if I remember right, uh, you said only probably a million dollars this year, but if I remember right, that's like an $80 million contract over three years. Is that accurate? Yeah, you know, Aaron, um, I believe that IDIQ is uh, a $225 million IDIQ. So there's three, comp three teams. Uh, we're with one of those teams providing uh, waste management and radiological services. Uh, which is obviously what we do. Uh, and uh, so it's really difficult to say. The last time we talked to EPA, which I've not talked to myself, but our, our folks have, uh, there's been about a dozen sites uh, teed up uh, by the characterization contractor uh, to, uh, to bid out. Uh, and they just haven't been through the procurement process. I don't know the size of those or timing or funding, uh, but I know the ceiling is, is high. Uh, the intent by EPA is, uh, to get rolling on these things this year, uh, and that's one, one reason why we're confident that that uh, with our technology uh, and the soil sorting stuff, that uh, it'll be uh, uh, very efficient, uh, and we'll be able to, to once we get deployed in the field, we'll be able to keep it going. So uh, right now we're only contractually, you know, signed up for that first task, but we're pretty confident that this thing is going to grow uh, because the uh, the contamination and and the mission of this thing is so large. Okay, and then uh, on the international front, um, you didn't mention anything about that, but it sounded promising the last several conference calls. What, what's the status of that, of that work? Yeah, I mentioned the JRC. I, may, I, may, I think I stumbled through that part of the script, Aaron, but the JRC is the Italy contract that we're, we're counting oh, on, okay. hope, 
hopeful for. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know if that's where I broke down or not. But uh, the bottom line is we're, we're expected to hear about the JRC bid any minute. Uh, and um, as I mentioned before, that's uh, you know it's nearly fifty million dollar job, and um, uh, it will be kind of the seed for uh, our overall European strategy. Uh, but overall, to answer your question, uh, we continue to get shipments from Germany. Uh, we're, we're, we're working with one right now to be shipped any day from Croatia and Slovenia, uh, as well as the UK and Italy. So the, the more we're, we're shipping, the better we're getting at it, uh, and more efficient we're getting at it to deal with all the logistics and all the paperwork that goes with you know, uh, shipping radioactive material across the, uh, the Atlantic. So it, it, it is going very well. Uh, the market is is really exploding, uh, and the marketing we've done has been very effective uh, to the effect that we're getting uh, the opportunity to bid on a lot of things, uh, and um, hopefully we'll see that JRC uh, announcement soon, uh, and then we'll start moving forward with uh, the new plant uh, in England, uh, which will kind of be the centerpiece of, of our European approach. Right. Okay, so for, for Hanford, a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I was pleasantly surprised to, to hear, well, at least if I understood it correctly, that even if your bidding conglomerate uh, were to lose, and it sounds like there's only two, uh, but even if you were to lose, um, that you still may get some business because of that small business um, clause as, as part of the contract. Am I, am I understanding that correct? Yeah, that, I mean, that is speculation. And, you know, I don't know the landscape if we were to lose, you know, who the winner is going to have on their team necessarily. Uh, so that's really just speculation. But, yes, yeah, so there will be opportunities for that. Uh, again, it's important to understand, as I've told investors, the ITDC is, is primarily uh, labor, uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the waste will be separate. Uh, and uh, the waste uh, will, for example, the DF law is, is part of that contract uh, to operate the DF law, and our waste will come out separately as a separate subcontract. Uh, and not through the ITDC to us. Uh, so um, there will be opportunity to do the waste that's defined in the Rod Amendment, uh, which uh, you know is, is slated to come our way uh, once it gets operational. Uh, and then there's other opportunities for other waste uh, that we'll likely get as well. And then there's other opportunities for labor uh, that um, uh, and other small business opportunities uh, along the way. So yes, to answer your question. Uh, there will be opportunities uh, as a small business, most likely, uh, with the awardee. Yeah, and you had mentioned up to $200 million. That was about my estimate as well. On, you know, obviously not necessarily every year, but on an annualized basis. And I'm just wondering, uh, that would go to small business. Uh, how many how many small businesses are there? there? There can't be that many small businesses that are doing what you do. So I just there's what, there's none of our competitor, our day to day competitors, which are WCS and you know, Energy Solutions and those types of firms, which are private companies. Uh, are none of those guys are small business. So you're absolutely right. It was a very limited small business competition with waste treatment capability. Uh, there's a few. Uh, there's a couple here in Oak Ridge. Uh, there's really not any uh, necessarily in the Hanford area to speak of at this point. Uh, but uh, there's, it's also very broad scopes. So there's other things to do. Uh, but as far as what we do, uh, there's very limited small business competition uh, in this space. Okay, thank you. Uh, so speaking of the larger competitors, um, some of them were mentioned in the final year that, for the TBI that you had talked about earlier. And that I think caught some people by surprise that you were the only one that was mentioned in the one for secondary waste. Uh, but can you explain what what the reasoning is behind that? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, Aaron, because I did get a couple questions about that this, this week. Uh, and uh, what it comes down to is the WEIR uh, references the environmental assessment that was done for NEPA. So the environmental assessment, uh, the goal of that document is to evaluate alternatives for um, uh, treatment of that tank waste uh, and treatment disposal. Uh, so when the EA looks at every alternative available that make, you know that's feasible, and it looks at the competition, uh, which includes WCS and Energy Solutions and us. Uh, so that w what that we referred to is the who was evaluated in the EA. Uh, and if you look at the EA, there's uh, a number of different you know evaluations done. Uh, 
based on risk, you know, from transportation to safety to environmental hazards and those kinds of things. Uh, we were the lowest risk uh, approach uh, because we're the only ones that are, you know, adjacent to the site. Uh, the other, you know, solutions would have to require transportation of untreated uh, radioactive of liquid, uh, you know, to, to at least 600 miles energy solutions and farther to WCS. So uh, obviously, the permafix approach, having a facility permitted right next door, uh, is the preferred solution. But it did include what was defined in the evaluation uh, for NEPA uh, in the WEIR document. That's why it's in there. So how would they transport that waste uh, to the permafix Northwest facility? It'll be in totes. Uh, and um, uh, on the back of a, of a large flatbed, most likely, uh, and they'll bring over several totes, you know, uh, a day when they're at full capacity. Yeah, seems like that would be uh, <laughs> rather dangerous to, take, to go all the way to Texas. To go all the way to, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, um, and then uh, I guess the final thing for me uh, it would be on the uh, secondary waste that you had mentioned earlier. Uh, really impressive that hear that revenue number, it's about twice my estimates, so also then twice the earnings per share that Howard had talked about. I guess just to make sure I understand and everyone else understands, I guess you're, this is because of the incremental uh, margins that you would have given your fixed cost structure. Is that, is that accurate? You have such higher margins because it's the incremental, it's not just, you know, what your current margins are? Yeah, I think I think Howard's back of the envelope number. Uh, this has been Aaron, and I think yes. his back of the envelope number is reasonable given, um, you know, our incremental margins, and then as Mark mentioned, there would be some additional fixed costs against that number. But I think, um, you know, just again back of the envelope, it's pretty reasonable given those volumes. Well, thank you guys. You've done a great job navigating through COVID. It seems glad to hear your the business is starting to turn the corner there and going to be profitable and then obviously potentially lucrative uh, stuff here at Hanford. So congratulations, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. We appreciate it. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Anthony Harple. Your line is live. Hi, guys. Uh, good morning. Thanks for holding the call. Um, I have a number of questions, many of which are, are clarification related, just given there's so many moving parts. Um, maybe to start out with, for the TBI program, um, can you please clarify what price per gallon you would realistically expect to get paid? Well, we don't want to get too deep. Uh, Anthony, uh, well, first of all, good morning, uh, into costing this thing. But uh, generally, uh, our, our established rates uh, that we have in our MSAs uh, are in, in the low $40 a gallon range for the actual treatment. Uh, that's the actual grouting. So if a, if a container of waste shows up on our dock, uh, in other words, we're not paying for transportation, and we just have to grout it, it's 40 to $45. And again, that can change based on the rate of nuclides and the different types of waste received, but that's a generally a good number. Uh, in TBI space, uh, if DOE uh, subcontracts to us to deliver those totes I mentioned uh, of waste to our dock, uh, they would likely subcontract us to grout and dispose of the waste. And if that's the case, uh, and we have to pay for transportation and disposal at uh, uh, an off-site landfill, uh, then that price uh, would be closer to $100 a gallon. Now, so, so we typically use $100 a gallon for the TBI as an alternative to include treatment uh, and uh, disposal uh, at, a, you know, at a Texas landfill at the WCS. So um, that's where those numbers come from. So do those same rates apply to treating the supplemental low-activity waste from Hanford's tanks outside of the TBI program? I assume they're the same? 
No, they don't. It's a good question, uh, Ant. They, they are different, and, and the reason they're different is important to us and important to uh, the exclusivity of our our program, and that is because uh, because of the agreements with the state. This waste, the secondary waste, coming off of vitrification, which is uh, what is defined as uh, with the state as the uh, preferred treatment alternative. So, what that means is. After comes the secondary waste comes off of DF law, we can put that waste in the uh, local Hanford landfill. So it won't go down the highway uh, to Texas or in, in Energy Solutions uh, in most cases. It may, there may be some exceptions. It will likely mostly or, or largely go back onto the Hanford site into their gigantic, beautiful new uh, landfill. Uh, it's designed just for this type of waste. So. Uh, it, it won't go very far away. Well, to be clear, I'm referring to the primary waste, the supplemental low activity waste you're doing in TBI. I'm saying once the TBI program is behind us and if this moves into the operational stage of treating the primary supplemental low activity waste, or would the rates that you would be getting paid be the same rates per gallon that you would be getting paid in the TBI program? For that primary waste, I'm a little confused. There's, so there's two different waste streams. There's one, the secondary waste coming off the flaw. That's the one that goes back yeah. on site, and then TBI, yeah. which is, as you said, supplemental. Uh, that's the TBI. So that that's all uh, supplemental, and that would be the hundred dollars. Okay, okay. So can you clarify whether the DOE has a officially made a decision to grout secondary wastes that are generated by vitrification of the tank's low activity waste, or whether this remains a proposal rather than an official decision? The, the Rod Amendment uh, is a, a quite a formal document, uh, and um, it, uh, it defines DOE's decision on how to disposition the waste coming off of the F law. Uh, you know, it goes through a lot of pain and suffering through the DOE to get that, those doc, those rod amendments approved, uh, and supplemental analysis and that type of thing. So, uh, it's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty formal decision in my mind. Uh, you know, it, it, it will, yeah, so to answer your question, yeah, it's a, in, in my, from my perspective, is a rod amendment it's very formal uh, and it's their intent to send uh, the secondary waste from DF law for commercial uh, treatment off-site off-site treatment okay can you please clarify whether the DOE has awarded the tank off-site secondary waste treatment business to you all to waste control specialists or to neither of you yet? They have not made any awards yet, uh, and we would not expect them to do that uh, until the plant gets operating or very close to operating in the hot capacity. Uh, we, What they'll do on this, Anthony, most likely, and there's some speculation here, is there's uh, each, or, each of the entities we've mentioned have contracts with the tank operating contractor, which at this point in time is WRPS. So WRPS is there, uh, notwithstanding who wins the ITDC. Whoever, whoever wins the ITDC obviously will, will get this contract. Uh, we have an MSA with them with established rates uh, that will likely be renegotiated along the way. Uh, and when the time comes for them to generate this waste uh, from DF law, uh, they'll, they'll put out a task order. Uh, maybe competitive, may not be. I don't know, uh, but they'll put out a task order. Uh, in the case of this one, since there's only one company named in the rod, uh, it'll likely just be a task order. We'll put in a price. Uh, they'll negotiate with us, uh, and then we'll go. So we have a contract in place. They'll put task orders uh, in place uh, as waste is generated, uh, and um, that's the contractual approach. That has not occurred yet, and like I said, won't likely occur until the flow is operated. And that is a late 2024 event? Correct. Okay. Um, 
And so if you all were to treat the secondary wastes that are that are generated by vitrification of the the hamper tanks low activity waste um i i may have completely misunderstood your comments but were you implying based on the revenue numbers you had mentioned earlier that you would realistically expect to get paid around $7,800 a cubic meter. Did I, am I getting that math right or did I misunderstand? Yeah, I don't, I have, I don't even have a calculator in front of me here, Anthony, but generally for 8,300 yards, 8,300 cubic meters, uh, we're estimating roughly 70 million annually in revenue. Okay. Um, and regarding the ITDC, so are you saying, Mark, that the scope of it as it relates to permafix only includes services, not treatment? I really can't talk about the procurement at all uh, because it's such a sensitive situation at this point in time, uh, but um, uh the scope, the RFP is public information and includes uh, managing the, the facilities uh, and waste management, uh, which would uh, include disposition of the tank waste uh, to close tanks. So uh, it would be a, a component of scope within that overall contract. And that's about all I can say about about the procurement. So, so if I'm hearing you right, then it's, we're talking about a $45 billion contract over 10 years, and it is a possibility that Permafix could generate services business from that contract as well as treatment business from that contract. Possible. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. It's possible. Uh, it's possible for both, services and treatment. Correct. Okay. And then last question, um, can you please give us an update, Mark, on the status of your of, of um, renewing your Northwest Facilities Dangerous Waste Regulation Permit? Yeah, that, that permit has been in the renewal process uh, for 12 years. Uh, so it's and uh, we continue to work with the state uh, and um, provide updates uh, to the permit. Uh, it's uh, uh, right now. I boy, Anthony, I, I think we're still another year off before we're, we could we can see uh, anything finalized. Uh, but it doesn't keep us from operating what we're you know we're doing what we're doing. What it does keep us from doing until we get the, the final one re, uh, renewed is new technologies like the GML system that we've got in place. Uh, we were able to run that through a treatability study uh, for a year or so, uh, but until we get the, the formal renewal, we can't uh, do something new like that. Um, uh, so it is impacting us uh, from, from that sense, uh, but uh, the state is going through the process as they've had the last 12 years, uh, and we're hoping to have it, have it completed uh, in about a year, if I remember correctly. It doesn't preclude you from um, treating the waste that we've been discussing through any of these other initiatives. No, no. which is which is demonstrated by the TBI stuff that we've already done. No, and we and we we do grouting all the time now. Uh, you know, similar processes, uh, and um, so we we would not we would not expect that to, that that permit renewal uh, issue or delay to have any impact on everything we're talking about here. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Ross Taylor from ARS Investment Partners. Your line is live. Thank you. Uh, we'll shift off of Hanford for a bit and like to talk to you about a couple things. One, what you're looking at with things such as uranium mines and how long do you think that ends up working out? What kind of 
opportunity does that have? Generally, what other kinds of opportunities are you seeing of that sort around the country that are starting to be freed up? And then I'd like to ask you to talk about what you see happening with regard to the Navy. The Navy has a lot of um, ships, more nuclear-capable ships, look like they're going to be coming offline again this year. They're building up what looks like a fairly interesting fleet of mothballed nuclear vessels that they need to deactivate. And where do we stand with the ability to kind of push those major contracts forward? Sure, Ross. Yeah, the EPA program for banning rain and mines, it's been a while since I've looked at that information, but I want to say there's there's like 180 abandoned uranium mines that uh, are in this, within this program. Uh, it was uh, it, it received a good slug of funding uh, about five years ago when these IDIQ bids came out. Uh, we rewarded that uh, awarded a, a contract with our prime, who's a Native American firm, uh, and um, and local to the area uh, in the Navajo region there uh, in the northeast. Uh, Arizona, uh, and um, this is the first one. So they've, they, there's a contractor they've hired across, uh, I believe it's TetraTech, uh, that their job uh, and it's been highly funded, and, and uh, most of the funding has been, I think, I think they actually spent all their funding, uh, where they're going around doing the characterization uh, and surveying and de- developing the scope for each one of those mines. Uh, as I mentioned before, I believe they have 12 or 18 done. Uh, and next step after TetraTech does that is they turn over the information to the EPA. EPA puts together a procurement uh, between these three bidders, these three awardees, uh, and they go. So we won the first one of those, uh, and um, uh, they're very remote locations, some more remote than others, uh, and they will be off and running and hopefully start making awards uh, subsequent to the first one uh, through the summer. Uh, some are very large, some are smaller. This is a smaller one, uh, and um, uh, but we're hopeful that once we get going, our systems will be in place and they can keep operating uh, And uh, once they're in the field because mobilization is so expensive on these types of things. So it's very difficult to tell you, uh, you know, what type of funding this year looks like because they've had funding for years and years and it's all been stifled because of procurement. I don't know if procurement is going to get things rolling this year or not or if it's going to be next year. But the projects remain, the objectives remain, uh, there's a lot of politics behind them, uh, and they seem to be off and running. Uh, like I said, our kickoff meeting for the first one uh, is uh, with EPA is actually next week. So uh, we'll have more information on that uh, by the next, by the next uh, earnings call. Uh, as far as the Navy goes, uh, the Navy, is, boy, it really got stifled too. Uh, you know, we, we reported a couple years ago on this call that uh, the uh, GAO and, and, uh, and may put a report together, they're going to decommission 48 ships. I think 12 of those are going to be nuclear, and they're all going to be done in four years. Well, nothing's happened uh, in about 18 months or two years uh, until about the first week and second week in March. They had an industry day, uh, the Navy did, excuse me, in, in the Navy headquarters in D.C., uh, and went over uh, the plans for the Enterprise to be the next vessel they're going to decommission. Uh, we're expecting uh, an RFP, I believe it's this summer, uh, and uh, that'll be the next one coming. So teams are forming on that. We're working with uh, with company, several companies to define the right team uh, based on the fact we've got some good project calls from the ship we're doing now. It's going very well, uh, and uh, we're hopeful to get on the winning team for that. I would, I would anticipate it to be quite a while for that's awarded, probably a year or so. Uh, and um, uh, then I think they'll the enable you off and running with that business model. Uh, I know the Nimitz aircraft carriers uh, also close behind the Enterprise, uh, and there's a few others that uh, names escape me at the moment that uh, will be on the list as well. So uh, we're hoping with this Enterprise initiative that uh, it'll be kind of the beginning of this, this market getting rolling, uh, and uh, hopefully we can get on the right team. And right now, these vessels are just sitting idle. There, it's like for the enterprise, my understanding is the enterprise is sitting at HII, I think the Ingalls uh, in Norfolk, uh, and uh, they're maintaining it. Uh, you know, it has eight reactors on it, so it's, it's a big job uh, and a complex one uh, to uh, 
to make it go away. So yes, it's sitting uh, in the in the harbor there, or the shipyard there in Norfolk. Nothing can go wrong with that. Um, mm. You talk about the competitive environment. It looks like in a lot of places you're operating, you have a very limited uh, com- number of competitors. And it would seem to me that one of the risks the government runs into in here is that it needs to make sure that it continues to have competitive options. So therefore, one would expect to see some spreading of business, my words, not yours. How do you see that environment? And and is that a not incorrect read that given the limited number of people who can do what you do, that basically over time everyone needs to win some? I surely like to think that, Ross, <laughs> uh, that that uh, not only the government but uh, even the primes have that same perspective. Uh, you know, if one company gets all the work, uh, it's not going to be – you want a competitive market. Uh, and uh, DOE certainly understands that. I think, you know, I think they, they consider that. I don't know how they consider it in these big proposal initiatives, uh, but I do believe that's the case and, and that everyone is sensitive to the comment you just made and, and uh, understands the importance of spreading it around as well. So, yes, I, I think that's an objective. So in areas where perhaps the other side, the other group won, there might be some unbiased or some uh, potential tilt to the idea of keeping your consortium and your team in, in the game. Otherwise, you risk losing the capability entirely. Yeah, that's, that's a, I, I just don't understand how that's going to all play out uh, with this award because it is so large, uh, and um, but uh, we certainly uh, you know have a long-term mission a- in the Richland uh, area up there, uh, and um, a very unique capability that other folks don't have. Uh, so uh, I would expect, no matter what happens, I would expect to be a player uh, on the waste treatment side of the house uh, for the long term with with that contractor. Yeah. And just a quick comment on obviously you mentioned some of the rail transport there. Obviously, everyone knows about what went on in Ohio, but I thought it was interesting. There's a lawsuit by a Native American uh, nation against the Burlington Northern Santa Fe for an oil train derailment uh, a number of years ago. I think it was back in 2015 that just after that trial started, Burlington Northern Santa Fe derailed another train on that in, that nation's property uh, or land. So I thought it uh, does highlight the fact that anytime you put anything on a train and haul it someplace, bad things can happen, um, right. which obviously increases the risk at, uh, and the cost of the project. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, I think it sounds like from what you're saying that a lot of this, I, I noticed the tenses that you're using, a lot of the tenses you're using are not what might call hopeful tenses, but expected tenses that you see this happening. And you see this is really like the game, you know, it's not the game might change, it's the game has changed and it is changing. And that uh, those pieces are already moving, the rocks are already sliding. Is that a correct read? Well, you know, Ross, we have to be careful to, to, you know, as public company to only speculate on these things. Uh, But uh, the, uh, so there is risk, obviously, we we all know, uh, know that going into this. But what Permafix has tried to do in the last seven years, is particularly, uh, is to get as many big irons in the fire as we possibly can, with the hope that a couple of them will will uh, will win. Uh, and uh, the one thing I am uh, very confident about is is the the rod that came out uh, that everyone has commented on uh, is. Uh, uh, what could be viewed to a large degree as a commitment by DOE to ship us that waste. There is risk that plant, you know, has to get up and running uh, and operate, uh, but that's a pretty, pretty big commitment they made uh, to uh, to commercialize uh, through local capabilities uh, that secondary waste from DF law. So uh, uh, we're uh, we're more optimistic than usual. Obviously, ITDC and OSMS are procurements. They can go either way, uh, and um, we could be either really lucky or not lucky, uh, but we feel like we've got enough other things going on that uh, we'll continue to see the growth we had before COVID, uh, irrespective of those wins. 
uh, and hopefully those those winds really tra transform us uh, if we can get a couple. Great. Yeah, it sounds like they should be transformational. And uh, I would think you probably have reason to be more optimistic than you just sounded. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Stephen Fine from Fine LLC. Your line is live. Good afternoon. How are you guys? Hello, Stephen. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a scripted comment, but I got two questions prior to it. Number one, you mentioned there were um, um, labor problems. Are, are they being rectified or rectified? Yeah, what, what it comes down to, Steve, particularly at Hanford, but also in Oak Ridge, uh, DOE has seen, a, as every manufacturing entity really has seen, uh, a big uh, gap in uh, labor, uh, and uh, particularly uh, with uh, the union folks. Uh, and um, uh, they've been hiring hundreds and, in some cases, thousands of people. Uh, and um, uh, we've lost a number of, of folks at both Hanford facility and Oak Ridge facility uh, to uh, the large uh, DOE facilities. Uh, you know, they have a little better benefits. Uh, we pay our pay is pretty similar, but uh, there's some advantages uh, and disadvantages uh, between each each of the firms. But with the big pull from those uh, hiring initiatives, we did lose a lot of folks, particularly a lot of folks at Hanford. Uh, and that all happened in Q4. Uh, it started early Q4 and got worse in the first week, two weeks of December. Uh, and um, uh, it really impacted productivity at Hanford. Uh, between the holidays. Uh, we've hired, uh, since then, we hired in December uh, very quickly. We're able to find folks. Uh, they did require a lot of training, uh, but they've been there since. Uh, and our general managers were all here in Oak Ridge uh, this week for an offsite. They all reported that uh, labor has not, been an issue, has not been an issue through the month of March, particularly uh, in most of February, uh, and that we're, we've got the labor part behind us, labor issues behind us. Good. All right, my, my next question before I read what I wrote. Um, you, in, in the write-up, it says there was 1.2 million written off from the medical. Uh, where does that all, you know, I, I understand what that was from, but how, how did that, um, um, how does, how does that, how does that impact the, uh, the, you know, the financials? I mean, so, so what is that? Is that 1.2 million less or, you, you know, in, in, Yes, yeah, Steve, that was all last year, 2021, and net, okay. net, it was zero because it was okay. within the, it was within the entity. So our medical segment, it was basically writing off money we'd invested into the medical segment. So Permafix Environmental takes the loss, but medical gets a gain from the write off. And so it, it's a wash in consolidation. Okay, thanks. All right, I, I'm going to read a statement. Um, you know, I've lived and slept your company, and, um, uh, you know, hopefully this will be informational. Um, I just wanted to applaud the progress and actions of Permafix. In that vein, I would like to express my thought on today's unique potential of Permafix. In 2006, I was introduced to Permafix and asked to do due diligence on the company. Among my three degrees, I am an engineer and an MBA. I was a hazardous chemical manufacturer for many years. I was a government contractor, but also a business and science consultant who throughout my career assimilated various technical businesses and opportunities in either commercialized or analyzed and reported. Immediately surveying Perm Fix, I realized there are four plants at the time in 2016 were essentially non-duplicable because of the plant, people, radiation permits, and unique ability to handle low mixed radiation waste. The infrastructure and its capabilities cannot be understated in its uniqueness and value. Since 2016, I have watched how Permafix has moved to diversify in a multitude of areas beyond those at Hanford. Clearly, Permafix is capable of being a $150 million plus company without Hanford. With treatment and service segments, this lends to a wide array of possibilities. Immediately when I started studying the Hanford Reservation, and particularly the vitrification plant being built, 
I frankly was aghast. Over 30 years, not one gallon had been treated from the 66 million gallons of mixed nuclear waste sitting in the 170 tanks. In 2022, there was $1.5 billion spent on maintaining the waste in the tank and building the deep floor plant to treat low-level waste. I immediately understood that 90% of the waste in the tank was low radioactive waste and more suitable for treatment by immobilizing and then solidifying with concrete. This has been done in Savannah for decades. Since 1992, Permafix has treated millions of gallons of mixed radioactive waste by immobilizing and then solidifying with an appropriate concrete. I thus immediately questioned the test bed initiative and its purpose. It just seems there could be a quicker path for treatment by Permafix. The waste in the tanks becomes even larger as it must be liquefied before treatment. So arguably there can be two to four times more waste to treat. Various sources as GAO, NRS, and NAS have stated it will take in any treatment way 60 to 70 years to treat the tank waste. A study completed by GAO last summer states immobilizing and solidifying the concrete will save tens of billions of dollars. The National Academy of Science recently states that immobilizing and then solidifying with concrete at an off-site facility and burying off-site would, would push treatment forward 10 years, thereby taking pressure from leaky tanks space and facilitating movement towards building a plant to treat the high-level waste. It will also ensure preservation of groundwater at Hanford. For over a year, this has existed in the tank farm a system called the Tank Side Cesium Removal Unit, the TISCR. The TISCR separates high and low waste. After three phases of filtering the product, remaining is a watery, mixed, hazardous, and low radiation product. Radiation is no more than one would experience in a medical test that is ready for treatment. The Tisker can do 7,200 gallons per day, and thus there is over 300 gallons sitting in a feed tank today. The nature of this product has been generally not vitrified. Last summer, I was exposed to non-cost studies of vitrification versus grouting. The name used for that, and grouting is the name used for the concrete process, but I underscore a misnomer because it is confounded with just covering waste with concrete and not immobilizing as Permafix would do. These studies were completed in the summer of 2021 by Laura Cree, who works for Washington River Protection Systems, the Hanford Tank Plant plant contractor in charge of maintaining the tank waste. This crew chose to use a million, million gallon samples for each mode of treatment. For growling, I will use, all waste was treated and there was no secondary waste. No heat is used. There is no diesel, copious amounts of water or hazardous chemical. The process is environmentally clean. The data Ms. Cree used was supplied by Savannah which, as stated, they had been grouting for years. Grouting is one-tenth the cost of vitrifying. Savannah has one reactor, so it has been argued that their hazardous waste is more homogeneous, while at Hanford there were a number of reactors and thus a multitude of hazardous waste to treat. Permafix has stated that it can or has treated the hazardous waste listed in the one 170 tanks. Dr. Jim Conco, who has a PhD in geochemistry and is well known nationally, states there should be no issue in treating the multitude of hazardous waste. For the vitrification, one million gallon model, about 340,000 gallons, so that's only one third was vitrified. And the other two thirds was secondary waste that has to be treated in ways other than vitrification. Data was supplied relative from Han, uh, Hanford contractors building the vitrification plant. With vitrification, it requires 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 3 million gallons of diesel fuel, which throws off over 20,000 metric tons of CO2, 2 million gallons of water, which mainly is contaminated and becomes secondary waste, 151 truckloads of hazardous chemicals. The amount of energy used would energize 15,000 homes. There was a statement that vitrification could cause 36 high consequent hazards. The model used assumes a 70% efficiency, but vitrification plants typically have efficiencies around 40%, and this should take longer, be more expensive, and possibly worsen the vitrification outputs. Permafix can treat now 300,000 gallons per year. 
which is equivalent to 1 million gallons of inputted waste into the vitrification plant, as maybe one-third will be vitrified. Permafix has related they can scale up to 3 million uh, treated gallons per year. This is equivalent to 9 million gallons of waste inputted into the vitrification plant. And note, the vitrification plant would create 6 million gallons of secondary waste. Governor Inslee of Washington State was interviewed in, in August 22 by the New York Times. The governor touted how he was early in, in calling for climate change. The legislature of Washington State has advocated concern regarding CO2 and environmental responsibility. Recently, our government has stated that any government contractor doing over $7 million a year must be responsible in its environmental profile. Relative to the above concerns for environmental strain, one can question how the political ecosystem of Washington State promotes the vitrification plants. The political ecosystem of Hanford is vitrified. In its focus that the tank waste needs to be vitrified. There seems to be no issue that, sank, that secondary waste would be treated by permafix, which in my mind is oxymoronic to opposition to permafix and mobilizing and solidifying waste with concrete directly. As a problem solver, I do not understand why permafix cannot start treating the waste in the Tisker now as the vitrification continues to be built. Then there would be two systems treating waste and help get the waste treated faster, provide backup. The Hanford Reservation is in an earthquake zone, and we know climate change is real. There needs to be an urgency because a black swan, with a black swan event, there will, this will negate no treatment of the waste. In January 2023, DO published a new rod, Rules of Decision how the waste would be treated with vitrification. This is plan that the rod last pu published in 2013. It was quite a compliment to Permafix unique ability that DOE proposed 2.2 million gallons of secondary waste would be treated by Permafix Northwest. And there was product that would go to the, uh, a, a Midwestern plant of Permafix too. The rod is framed so the treated secondary waste would come back to Hanford and bury there. This is an important nuance implying the nearness of permanent fixed plants. And someone asked the question, by the way, in the rod, it distinctly says nothing will be shipped other than by truck. And two, implying the treatment prowess of permafix. The rod is also very interesting with the section on acetonitrile. This is a potential hazard created in the vitrification plant, which under certain heated conditions can create cyanide gas. All the acetonitrile would come direct to permafix. Hey, hey Stephen, this is, this is Mark. I think we're going to probably have to wrap up. Mark, do you have? Can, can you conclude on that, Stephen, before we move forward? Excuse me. Yeah, we, we're going to need to move on. I'm afraid. Uh, are you close to the end, or can you have a conclusion you can, can wrap up? I have two more paragraphs. Okay. Finally, there has been a tank maintenance contract for the tank farm sitting out there for award. It is for ten years and, and forty-five billion. Permafix is part of the two consortiums bidding. If Permafix consortium wins, Permafix would have people on the ground at the tank farm, irrespective of any treatment at their northwest plant. The contract encompasses maintaining the tanks, waste, and running the vitrification plant. In any case, Permafix will treat waste. That is a given. And, of course, it will be a significant impact to the financials of Permafix. Over the last year, I have commented to DOE Ecology and EPA of Washington State had comments by court order included in the files of the consent decree. And my comments are publicly included in the National Academy study on low-level waste at Hanford. In this vein, I urge you to speak to your congressional representatives in order to start treating waste at the Hanford tank farm. There is no reason the permit fix should not be treating waste right now. I'm done. All right. Thanks, Dave. We appreciate your passion on this topic, Stephen, and your support. Uh, I do have to say that um, that the statements that uh, were made by Stephen uh, were Stephen's alone and don't necessarily reflect all the views and opinions of PESI uh, as a company. Uh, but uh, we appreciate your support, Stephen. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for participating in uh, the fourth quarter and year-end conference call. Uh, we remain extremely confident uh, in the outlook for the business. We appreciate the continued support of our shareholders, and we look forward to
providing further updates uh, as developments unfold uh, this quarter. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. This concludes today's event. You may disconnect at this time and have a wonderful day. Thank you for your participation.